Hi, everyone. Welcome to Bridging the Gap. I'm your host, Kelly Lavelle, and this week I'm joined by our expert guest, Dan Rockwell. He is here to talk to us about strategies of becoming an effective leader, and I'm really pleased to have Dan. He's a leadership coach and consultant. Six years ago, he started a blog called Leadership Freak, and since then, it has been ranked the number one socially shared leadership blog. Dan now dedicates his work to coaching leaders, consulting organizations, and giving presentation on leadership. He also co-authored a book called The Character-Based Leader. So suffice to say, leadership is a very big theme in your life, Dan, uh, but could you perhaps start us off by sharing a little bit of how you got started on your own journey as a leader? Well, um, I was tall, and I think that helped. Um, I was tall from first grade on, and uh, you might not like that uh, things like physical attributes matter, but uh, it, they do. And uh, being tall is, in some situations, um, desirable. And I say that tongue-in-cheek because I think I got into leadership and I had no idea what it was and really have been terrible at it for most of my life because um, I would, I, you know, I could enter a room and be considered a leader, uh, maybe also because I'm an extrovert. And again, very unfortunate that we have to think leaders are tall and extroverts. But, um, you know, I, I really got into leadership early on simply because, uh, you know, I was good at sports. So I was the captain of the basketball team. You know, I was president of the senior class, et cetera, et cetera. So I was kind of like one of those, one of those, uh, I don't know. I just fell into it. I wish I could say there was a plan, but I just fell into it, Kelly. Well, I think sometimes uh, there is that larger debate, right? Are, are leaders born or are they made? Or maybe a third option is, do you fall into it or stumble upon it? In your opinion, do you feel that um, you were born that natural leader or do you feel that it was more your circumstances that made you the leader? Well, first of all, I never met a leader who wasn't born all of them have been born. There are some natural attributes or character traits that I think lend, might lend someone to be a leader. Um, sadly, charisma is confused for leadership and, and or like being tall or being able to play a sport well. You know, So we think somebody's a good leader because they can play a sport well or because they're an actor on TV or something like that. Uh, I said all of that to say uh, I, I'm convinced that leadership can be learned uh, by anybody uh, if, if we define if we define it simply as uh, leadership is influence like John Maxwell does. So with that in mind, um, how can someone who maybe isn't tall or charismatic, <laughs> so to speak, in the sense that we're we're quiet and small, how can we grow as a strong leader? I think the first thing that has to happen in our minds is that um, leadership is not simply about getting something done, but it's about getting things done through others. And that shift is is a difficult shift to make, um, especially because we um, are really anxious to get things done. So you have a person who has a, vi a vision or a dream. They want to get they want to make a difference somewhere and they go out and they start doing it. And we confuse that with leadership. No, that's doing things. Uh, Leadership is when you have a team of people who also buy the vision and who also are, cre you know, fulfilling that vision in some way. So when you think about becoming a leader, there's a mental shift that has to take place. And it's not a, necessarily about what you do, but, but about what others do. And that shift can be a slow, uh, take a long time, it took a long time for me. You know, I thought I was a leader because I was captain of the team or I, you know, I was up in front or those kinds of things. And th those are all confusions, at least in my world, that took me away from the idea that really leadership is about what you get others to do, not what you necessarily you do yourself. Well, I think you bring up an interesting point there, and it really emphasizes um, the strength of what we call the quiet leader. You can have the most outgoing, loudest person in the room that says, this is my way or the highway, and you could feel from maybe an outside perspective that they're the leader, but it's the one who's able to bring a team together and may even be behind the scenes, but can get something done that in many ways is actually the true leader, the one just speaking and kind of kind of taking up the space in the room may not actually be productive in achieving that mission. Yeah, you really nailed it there. Um, I think these days for me personally, leading from behind is the bigger part of what I do. 
Um, I used to think leadership was about leading from the front, and there is an aspect of leadership that is about leading from the front. But leading from behind for me means working with individual team members and then bringing teams together and finding where people best fit and help them tap into their own purpose and motivations, help them figure out what their skills are and how those skills can be applied to the vision and help them see how they're benefiting not only others, but themselves by joining in. So there's all this stuff that goes on from behind that for me is really what leadership is about more th these days than it used to be. And I think in some sense, um, leading from behind is um, much more difficult or more of a challenge, I should say, because um, it is a little bit easier to kind of lead from the front and kind of crusade, so to speak, to your path. But um, leaning behind takes a lot more um, what I call active listening and um, awareness of those around you and, and almost empathy and sensitivities to how they're feeling and in, in motivations in some sense, because you almost have to kind of find their way for them in a sense of how they fit into the picture and help them see how they fit into the picture. Um, do you have any advice on kind of how someone goes about developing those kind of behind the scenes leadership skills? Yes, I do. And, you know, I, I appreciate what you're saying here. And I also think one of the challenges of leading from behind um, is the expectation of others, especially, you know, in some countries, the expectation that the leader is the upfront charismatic person, and then you, you're not going to be that. Now, people would determine, well, you must not be a leader because you're leading from behind, because you're learning about other people, because you're leveraging other people, you're not stealing the spotlight or you don't need the spotlight. Those types of things can actually be disappointments in some organizations because the organization is looking for the charismatic leader. Now, having said that, um, you know, how do you start leveraging this idea of leading from behind? And the first thing I would say is that there's a mental shift. I think we, we may go into leadership thinking about what we get from others and leading from behind is about what you give to others. And, and it could be that listening ear. It could be that clarity of thought. It could be the idea that they can make a difference. Um, it, it could be the coaching through a challenge. Um, it could be helping them find their stride and their greatest contribution. Those types of things take humility. They take listening. They take patience. They take a set of skills that we don't typically apply to leadership. There are also skills too that I um a lot of there there are soft skills and I think actually in a, many ways in today's society we sometimes neglect the importance of soft skills just in general even uh, in how they are applied into our lives. Um, I I even just look at like a business business scenarios and things like that and we think um, sales is a great example and similar to leadership where you think you have to be kind of this outgoing. Um, kind of forward aggressive person in order to get a sale but the best sales are kind of when you're actually when you talk the least in the meeting and all you're doing is listening and you have the other person talking so um those skills of listening and um and, and empathy and things like that are i think increasingly becoming noticed by employers or um, organizations and such as almost being deficient in their teams or wanting to foster it more have you have you found similar trends well, I've, I see a trend in the circles that I run in uh, that has to do with coaching leadership, which has a lot to do with listening and reflecting. Um, so, I, you know, back to the idea that, you know, perhaps the typical view of leadership is that the leadership is doing the, the leader is doing the talking um, versus the leader is doing the listening. Uh, really does take that mental shift. It takes uh, a, a willingness and a belief that really leadership is about others and not just about what, you know, what we're doing. And then looking on your journey, because um, you started off by sharing kind of how you were in some sense kind of thrown into your leadership at the beginning, just by the nature of, of your environment. Um, when was it for you that you found that shift where you kind of sh shifted from kind of being a leader by circumstance to being a leader by choice? Very late in life, um, I would say it's probably now eight, eight or nine years ago, seven or eight years ago, and uh, I, I went, uh, I took a month off, 
And I remember the day in July, not the date, but the day in July, I'm sitting on the back deck. We live out in the country and I'm sitting on the back deck looking over the valley. And uh, it dawned on me that uh, I didn't have to do what I was doing. And I realized that I had been defining myself by what others expected me to be or do. And I came to the conclusion really as time went on from that, that the journey of life is learning to define yourself by who you are, not what others expect. And so when it comes to being a leader and making the shift, honestly, I spent a lot of my leadership career thinking that leadership was all about upfront and all about what I did and all about having people do what I wanted them to do. And, you know, trying to be that, uh, I, you know, the charismatic leader, you know, charge and everybody's all excited and all of that kind of thing. And so these days, uh, that shift really came about because I started viewing myself differently and I started finding the courage to say, you know, this really isn't what I'm all about and I don't need to define myself by this organization or by that role. And then finding my own voice and finding my own path um, has changed the way I, like, I look at leadership. Well, I think you touched on uh, an important point there were, um, in, in order to lead others, you first must be able to lead yourself. Or I, I truly believe that that strong sense of self serves as that foundation. Um, and so in that self-discovery, I feel that that can happen in many stages in our life, but that is particularly um, an experience or stage that youth experience kind of as we're trying to find our identities, we go through a similar process of trying to understand kind of um, our purpose, so to speak, and who we are and how we define ourselves. And it's very easy to kind of get caught up in defining ourselves with the labels or um, the roles that kind of life circumstances put us in. So do you have any tips or advice on how young people who might be in that scenario right now or who may right now be defining themselves by, kind of, by what others have said, how they could initiate that process uh, of digging a little deeper? Well, you you actually, I think, hit on something that's important. And from when we're children, we try to please our parents. Then we go to school. We try to please our teachers. And then we, you know, get involved in sports. We try to please our coach. Then we get a job. We try to please our boss. And we're really living our lives pleasing others. Now, we should make sure to know that um, really success always includes pleasing someone else. You know, you please your customer. So there is a sense in life where pleasing others is a very good and healthy thing as long as we don't define ourselves by that process. I think at the stage that, uh, uh, for your audience of, you know, how do you, how do you learn to find yourself? And I would say, first of all, it's not by sitting under a tree contemplating the meaning of life in, in you know, sitting in a lotus position with your, you know, humming. Uh, not that I'm against self-reflection. I practice it. Um, I really think going out and doing things and figuring out where your energy is and then doing more of the things that give you energy is one of the best ways to find out what you're all about. You know, when, you, when we're thinking about college age and, you know, 25 to 35 year old kind of people. And so my, I, I would recommend a lot of different experiences. Listen to the listen to your inner voice as far as where the energy is, and follow that. I really, uh, I really resonate with with what you said in terms of kind of, um, kind of learn your, discover yourself by doing and and, and getting involved or where your energy is. Uh, my my personal journey was looking actually as you were saying that I was kind of envisioning my my journey and it was very much I I find um, I found my strength and my voice. Um, when I was volunteering and as soon as I kind of found um, some of my passions of media or entrepreneurship and I started to do more and more of that, the more innately my confidence grew um, and I ended up kind of evolving from kind of what this shy academic kind of perfectionist into understanding um, who I was and, and having a very strong vibrant voice more as a leader and building teams and things like that. So. I think there's a lot of merit to what you're saying in terms of getting involved in, in having a, almost a, an interactive discovery. I think part of this that, you know, thanks for sharing that, Kelly, because I, I loved hearing you talk about it. I'm, I'm, 
I have something I'd like to say, and I, ha I would like to ask you about what else was a major contributor in how you found your own voice. I think I'd like to ask that first. Do you mind if I ask? Yes, of course. Um, part of finding my own voice was, A, first realizing I didn't have one. So realizing that I, very much actually to our, our, our conversations right now is um, I defined myself by everything that I did in terms of my circumstances. I defined myself by my grades, my, my extracurriculars. I was the dancer, the, the student president, and all these different kind of more superficial roles. And I realized um, in a time in my life where I had some of those roles stripped away from me, that once I didn't have those roles to hide behind, I really didn't know who I was and I was a shell. And um, that's when I had kind of that moment and realization that I needed to, to really understand myself if I was to make any impact in the world. So that really kind of sparked me on my journey. Yeah, good for you, good for you. And I, I feel like part of this is the courage to say no to things. Um, and this, the idea that we might be able to better find our own voice by going out and doing things and trying things is, I think, a useful suggestion as long as when you find something that really doesn't work for you, you have the courage to say, um, this, this is not the path I'm going versus if you're a real people pleaser, and I'm, I'm all about that. I mean, that's been a big part of my life, pleasing people. And if you're a real people pleaser, it can be difficult to say no. And so a part of the journey for finding your own voice is learning where, what to turn your back on and finding the courage to do that. You know, Kelly, I want to swing around if you don't mind. I think there's something else to this part of this. And Others see in us things that we don't see, and, and it's always awesome. We talk about finding your voice. It's always awesome when someone else can look at you and they will see potential or they will see talent or they will see skill or strength or whatever where you really don't see it. There's some recent research that says uh, the people who know us well are about two times more likely to see who we really are than we are. And, and I, I think that's something useful for us to think about when it comes to finding our voice, and that is listening to the voice of others. I think, I think you're, you're correct in that, and very much so. If we kind of start, if we go back again and using kind of my journey as that example, um, where I really kind of grew was I started as a motivational speaker, but it was actually hearing the feedback of my peers and how the work I was doing actually impacted them that actually encouraged me to continue on. And slowly over time, I started to carve out what that voice is, what my purpose, what my place was by almost letting my peers um, kind of guide me in that way, but not in a way of where they were by circumstance putting me in a box, but more in starting to, I guess, um, kind of reinforce the work that I was doing and kind of showing uh, me that I was on that right path. So I think you, yeah. you're right in the sense of if we can be, and then that goes back right to those soft skills and that terms of awareness of how aware are we of um, our surroundings and our relationships and um, kind of feed, getting feedback, even kind of those, um, the body language and feedback from others. All of my life, and I've been involved in public speaking since I was like 16, I think. And so I'm 60. That ought to give you an idea. Uh, and uh, all of my life, people would tell me after they would listen to me talk, um, you really make me think. You make me think about things in a different way. And it always surprised me because I couldn't say that I would, I set out to do that. And it was sort of, it felt like an accident to me. It felt like um, you know, sort of a peripheral thing, uh, because sometimes what is easy to us seems like it's not really that meaningful. So if, some, if it's something that comes naturally, if it's something that's in your strengths and you, you do it, for example, like what I was doing is helping people kind of, you know, filter through ideas and, and come to new conclusions, um, I don't, I, 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 would, I would be at a loss, you know, when people would say, gee, you really make me think uh, today. And again, you know, I told you seven, eight years ago, you know, it was a real turning point in my, my journey. I'm, I make a living with this curiosity that I have. I didn't know how powerful 
this idea of helping people think and find clarity and summarize what they're saying back to them, those types of things that I was just doing so easily. And so I thought it wasn't that meaningful because it was easy to me. I didn't realize how valuable it was to others. It's interesting that you're saying, because I've been thinking and kind of with, um, with uh, going, going kind of focusing and narrowing in on that kind of like how to leave from behind. Um, what comes to mind is I am um, quiet leaders, the ones that there's, there's individuals like, for example, where you always, you're always that person that somehow your friends or people in your life always seem to come to you and share their problems and open up to you. And you never know why they do, but they just, you just seem to be that person that everyone goes to. And that may seem just innate and kind of like you never think about it. I have, an, I have a colleague who is in a very similar scenario where she's just a very trusting individual that you just naturally feel like you can lean on her just by the nature of, of who she is. Um, and that might not seem to her as a skill, but it is an incredible trait of hers that serves her well as a social worker or in, in, in different paths in her life where she's actually leading from behind and really helping people, but doesn't even maybe even realize she's doing it in the moment. Yes, and you know, I love working with more introverted leaders, and I, I work currently with, I'm working with uh, uh, three or four uh, introverted leaders, all of them 30 to 33, something like that, 30 to 35, and, and there's such power there, there's such uh, opportunity there. I would, let me just do a little side note here, Kelly, and that is uh, with, when you're a person who others come to, often you begin to carry the weight of the world around with you. And this is going to be a hindrance to that kind of person. It's one thing to be the person who listens, but it's another thing to maintain optimism and forward facing curiosity. Um, I, what I've noticed, and I don't know about your friend, but what I've noticed about quiet, sometimes quiet leaders or especially compassionate quiet leaders is they circle the black hole a lot. And they, they, they're concerned about how people feel and the pain and the difficulties and all of that. And their life begins to center on that. And they become, you know, very compassionate, very merciful, very kind. But they also become kind of dark. And they, they kind of lose this passion for the future. And all they see around them are problems. And again, I don't know your friend. And so I don't, I don't mean to say that. But I do, you know, when you're a person who likes to kind of lead from behind and they're very sensitive to people... Um, this can, it's very useful, but I, I keep using the expression forward facing curiosity. People come to you, they want to talk about problems, they want to talk about what's wrong, and it's important to listen for a little while. But man, if you do not turn that conversation to the future, you're not really leading. Maybe you're counseling, maybe you're comforting. That's all good, that's all useful. But if you want to lead, you have to practice forward facing curiosity. Yes, you, it, almost like, um rather than being a sponge, kind of be a mirror or something like where light bounces off and, and projects back out in the sense of there. Yeah, I, I do find that even if you're just um, an empathetic person or um, uh, you, you do sometimes kind of absorb the emotions of others. And if someone else is having a bad day, you make them feel better, but you do so by kind of absorbing their, <laughs> their sadness or despair and, and into your life instead. I, um, so. I, 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 I totally agree with you. I know a couple of people that, that I work with. And honestly, I'm not sure that they're really cut out to lead because they, it's almost impossible for them to think about making someone uncomfortable. Or when I say uncomfortable, I mean uh, stretching them or challenging them. The first thing out of their mouth is always something to do with how somebody might feel. And, and it's awesome. I mean, every, you know, the world needs all of this. And I'm not encouraging us to be hard-hearted leaders. What I'm saying is, if you're really, really good at empathy, and you're not, you're not also really good at pressing into the future, I, I, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if you can be a really, you can lead without that forward-facing approach as well. So, with that in mind, is there um, a good strategies for leaders to overcome that tendency to make um, kind of those um, to make rash decisions or to kind of, um, like you say, kind of absorb rather than um, project forward? I think one of the best things that especially a younger leader can do is to um, ask people 
um, how they're doing. And, and it's not just a how you're doing, but it's um, you explain what it is that you're trying to accomplish and then say, uh, how am I doing with that? Or what do you see me doing that's really helping that? Or what do you see me doing that really doesn't serve me well in that case? For example, you know, a leader might say, you know, I'm really good at listening and compassion and I'm really not good at challenging people. And so I've been working on challenging people. What do you see me doing that's re helping me challenge people? What do you see me doing that's really, you say, well, that's not challenging people at all and get that feedback. I'm going to go back to that. You know, others see us sometimes better than we see ourselves. And if we want to succeed, it's important to listen to others. And here's the thing to listen to. The thing that makes the least sense to you may be the thing that's most important because it's, it's speaking into a blind spot, it's speaking into something that it's awkward. You don't want to hear it. It doesn't make any sense. And uh, for me personally, again, you know, I, I started listening to younger voices, you know, that uh, 25 to 35 year old age group. I started listening to them um, seven or eight years ago, really paying attention. And lots of times I would hear things that didn't really sit well with me. And I would think about them. I think I need to listen and go with this. If, if we go with what I'm all about, well, that's just, you know, that's what we've always been doing. But if I listen to this, it's different. It's unusual. It, to me, it is. And how can I then take that in and move that ball forward or maybe even more importantly, encourage others to move that ball forward and you know, be a supporter? Two things I always find in leaders are they're good at questions and they're good at reflection and <laughs> they're good at bringing the two together um, to, to kind of continually um, assess both their situations and their, and their kind of missions or goals, but also to assess themselves while they're doing it. Um, yes. So I always find that they go hand in hand. Um, with that being said, um, between so that we've talked a lot about the importance of, base, of strong interpersonal skills and, and those soft skills, but often, always as well, leaders have to have a creative vision um, or kind of of where they're going and projecting forward. So to what do you feel is more important for youth to develop as a successful leader first, the creative vision or interpersonal skills? Well, if you're great with vision, then develop your interpersonal skills. If you're great with interpersonal skills, develop your ability to create a vision. Um, I've seen very visionary young people who were not good with people, and they're, they're a source of frustration. Uh, here's the problem with visionary people. They're always unhappy with things. It's never enough. You always need more. You know, there's, you know somebody looks at it and see, sees progress, and the real strong visionary looks at it and says, oh, man, we, you know, it's, it's all not good enough. Well, if you don't learn how to relate to people and energize other people and appreciate the, the energy that they're putting in, then you discourage them. You become really a source of irritation. So if you're a highly visionary young person, then, then you better learn how to um, listen, empathize, encourage, go with, you know, all those kind of things that have to do with emotional intelligence and building strong relationships that, um, by the way, I'm going to go back to this uh, on building strong relationships, and that is, what can I do for you? Not so much, what can you do for me? So the visionary leader needs to learn interpersonal skills. The person who's really good with people, you know, heck, you can you can run around in a circle for your lifetime being really good at people, with people. So that's the person who needs to look and say, you know, what what is that true north? What is that thing out there we're going to? What are we willing to commit ourselves to? What are we willing to invest ourselves in that's out there in the future? Yeah, I always think, I'm envisioning kind of what you're saying, this kind of like ensure that you have your north star and you're moving towards it, but you have um, your team with you, so to speak, like you have, <laughs> so you, have your, you have your group with you as you're moving. So if you're going to that north star and you're alone, you're, there's something missing in that picture. You need to look at the interpersonal skills. And if and you have a great group of people, but you're really, you've lost your, you don't really have a sense of direction, then you might want to look more to that creative vision side. <laughs> you, 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 you probably would. I would say this too, Kelly, that if you're leading an organization or a group, you have a team and you have somebody on the team that is like this, it's important to run interference for them. There is this sense of why, why can't we all get along? And that is important for teams, but 
sometimes the very unusual, irritating people, for example, a real strong visionary person who is very unhappy with how things are going and really wants things to be different and better, that drives everybody else crazy. Well, you know what? Everybody else needs to be a little crazy. Everybody else needs to kind of feel that pain too. However, as a leader, you may need to protect that real strong visionary. You may need to work with them. You may need to run interference for them so that, that you know, they're not totally ineffective. Um, you know, I've done this over and over of, you know, oh, you know, people say, oh man, he drives me crazy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, you know, just let's just step back for just a minute and let's see what happens. And, you know, maybe you need to go over here and do this or whatever, run the interference so that the, the real strong personalities on the team can uh, kind of blossom a little bit. Sure, they need to develop themselves, but in the end, honestly, there are some people that are going to be so lopsided because they are so good at something that to, to make them more balanced is to lose this unusual contribution that they're going to make. Yes. I find, I find often um, the answer to that usually lies in, in to run the interference is um, acceptance and understanding. A lot of the times of understanding kind of, they drive you crazy, but understanding that's who they are and that's kind of their personality and just the way they get things done. It, sometimes softens the the irritation a little bit if you keep reminding yourself oh, that that's 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 who they are <laughs> and understanding where they're coming from as opposed to they're not doing this specifically just to kind of irritate me or kind of get under my skin this is just how they see the world and this is how they think and i find that if once you establish that common ground of understanding um that really does help uh with that interference i have a person on my team kelly who has driven me crazy for most of my life. I'm a visionary kind of guy. I'm nothing's ever really done in my world. You know, we can have a meeting and it's like, we're, we're doing this and we're ready to go. And I can be on the way home and I can think, Oh, oh my, I had this brilliant idea. Right. And so now I'm, you know, I'm going to call somebody and I would talk to my friend who is, uh, he's a CIO of a large organization. And I, you know, I would, I would say, let's, let's, let's do, and he would go nuts. He would Hey, Dan, didn't we already decide this? And I used to think he was a foot dragger, but he's a doer. And a doer needs to see the path forward because a doer doesn't want to start something they can't complete. Me, I'm ready to build the airplane in the air. We'll figure it out. What are you worried about? He used to drive me crazy. Now when I start to see him, you know, shuffling his feet and kind of like uncomfortable, I turn to him and say, hey, what's going on? What do I need to know? What am I missing? Because his whole worldview is so different from mine and I need it. It's awkward to me, but I need it. You're you're preaching to the choir there. I'm so <laughs> I, I'm very much the same way. We'll look at a product or something, and I'll immediately be like, "Oh, should we we could do this now with it," instead of realizing in the moment to even just appreciate the plan that we've already achieved or or the plan of how to get there. It's more like, "Oh, and then we can do this and that," and then and then I I have found on several occasions I've caused a lot of confusion and disruption in my team because. There are, are a lot of doers on my team who need that clear path and that structure of A to B to C, where I'm already on Z. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I I I agree with you there. It's understanding that we're at leaders can come in different forms, and we think in different ways. And I think having a mutual understanding of the ways we think, and that we need the other halves because you're right. You can't kind of like a teeter-totter or a balance beam, so to speak. If you lean too much on one way, you you risk kind of toppling over um, and you need that even balance. Mm. Yeah, good for you to, for seeing that. I mean, that's so powerful. And listen, you have a team of doers, good for you. You drive them crazy and, and they drive you crazy. Uh, I mean, listen, they don't need you. Doers will do just fine without you. They, they got plenty to do. They can do all their lives. So, um, you know, you're fortunate if you have a, a team of doers and uh, uh, good for you. Good for you. Well, yes, I, I, I do agree, though. Like you need the balance because, yes, they can do as much as they want, but they might not do in a 
in a direction, right? The, the visionary is the one who takes what they do into a new height or um, kind of a tangible sense sometimes. Because um, you could do it, but you could do it in a circle if you don't have that vision to kind of take you out of that box, so to yeah. speak. Well, my, my experience with a doer is that uh, they like systems and they like certainty and they like, uh, you know, seeing all the next steps and all of that, which really lends itself to stagnation. It, 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 I'll tell you what I think about is when I think about the doers, I'm so thankful for the doers in my world um, it, because they help me see things in a little different light. Um, I po I've learned to poke them gently. Um, th the, the gentleman that I mentioned, uh, who was a CIO, who was a real doer, I remember having coffee with him a few years ago, and I just looked at him, and I said, what if you're selling yourself short? See, he's he's all about certainty and systems and all of that, and he was involved in something, and I just, I, I we're, we're friends, been together for a long time, and I just looked at him, and I said, what if you're selling yourself short? And a cup, we had a couple of coffees at different times. And, and now he is no longer doing what he was doing. He's doing something way bigger. It was a gift that I brought to him because he is, he's definitely going to choose certainty over uncertainty. I think that's a, a perfect kind of um, synergistic to what, how we start the conversation in the sense that leadership in a lot of sense, to become an effective leader, we have to have understanding and be able to to listen and lead from behind to help others kind of see that vision. So when we have, if we're a visionary, we help help the doers see the light of where they can take what they're doing to that next level. And then if you're a doer, helping that visionary see that they, how to bring that idea to the ground, so to speak, how to make that idea happen so their head's a little bit more out of the clouds, because we can stay in the clouds all day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I really could. <laughs> um, and so I think that really comes down again to like, to, to leaving behind, but together. For those of you listening, it's your turn now though. I want to hear what you think. Are you a doer or are you a creative visionary? <laughs> Where do you feel we need to bridge the gap to become more effective leaders? Please add your thoughts to the conversation using the hashtag Bridging the Gap on Twitter. And give this podcast a thumbs up if you like some of the advice and insights that we've shared today. Thank you for listening. And remember to check back Thursday for our next chat. Together, we can start bridging the gap between industry and youth. Thank you, Dan. I really appreciate some of your insights today. Thank you, Kelly. It's a pleasure to be with you.